All right, our next speaker this morning is Heidi Fern from the Space Studies Institute. Hello, good morning. My um, name is Dr. Fern, and I'm going to be talking about uh, Mac effects in space in space propulsion. Uh, specifically, uh, with oh, let me mention my team members. Uh, we've got a few of them with me in the audience. I've got uh, Jim Woodward sitting at the back, and also Jose Rodell sitting at the front here. So, uh, if there's many technical questions, they can help me out with the experimental and the computational work. Um, I'm going to be talking about an interstellar mission for a heavy spacecraft, uh, 15 tons of it, in fact. Uh, we want to go out and we want to come into go speed up, slow down, go into orbit, and then take data and send it back to Earth within a 25-year mission span. So uh, this is not really in competition with the guys doing the, uh, the solar sails because we, we're, not, we're not doing a flyby. We want to go up and go, go in close and personal to Proxima B, say, and take a good close look at the planet and then send back data. And, uh, and we want to go into orbit around it and really take a close look. So. Um, the NIAC study was a phase one, and uh, the first task was to improve current laboratory scale devices to provide long duration thrusts and practical propulsion. And when we were supposed to design uh, new power supplies and electrical systems to provide feedback and control, and uh, to, to basically improve the mega drive thrust that we were getting. And finally, of course, to, to uh, put those two together uh, to, to come up with a nice probe design um, so that we could take data and record it and send it back to Earth within a 25-year mission. So what we want to do again, and it's a big mission, is to actually go out to Proxima B uh, with, a, with a huge spacecraft, 15, 15 metric tons of it, and uh, take a close look at Proxima B and send back uh, data. And of course, it's going to be a fairly, fairly big challenge. Uh, we're going to have to fly out through hazardous space uh, to 4.2 light years. We're going to speed up, accelerate to about 0.4 C, and then decelerate again, and then go into orbit around Proxima B, and uh, return that data to Earth. And uh, <clears throat> well, uh, what, what propulsion technology can possibly enable this, you might ask? Well, our MacFX gravitational assist drive doesn't require ejecting any propellant, so there is no propellant. So really, the rocket equation does not apply. I really wanted the equation there with a big boot and sort of kicking it off the, off the stadium there, but they wouldn't let me do that. But anyway, um, so we, we, we don't have to worry about the rocket equation, seeing as we, we don't have any mass of, of fuel. And in fact, the one thing in the rocket equation that we would have liked was the mass of the rocket, but they don't allow that to change. They always set that equal to zero, so it's not doing us any good. Um, and of course, the benefits of only needing electrical system for operation is that we can keep the, the probe design in, within reasonable bounds. And so 15 metric tons, like I said, is, is what we're going to end up with. <laughs> yes, you're probably wondering, how on earth are we still going to do this? Well, um, it, we're actually just using standard physics. It's just general relativity. Um, in fact, uh, Max principle itself, it, it, we're just saying that uh, um, the local inertial frame is uh, completely determined by dynamical fields of the universe. And that was one of the quotes in, that's Max principle. That's one of the quotes from Carlos Rivelli's book. Have it in front of me just to make sure I get it right. Um, so, but the Mach effect is more of the idea of, of an object which has internal energy changes um, being able to fluctuate in mass um, due to interaction with the rest of the matter in the universe. So that's basically the Mach effect. So it has to have a fluctuation in energy. And uh, I've, I've written down just one equation for you to look at, this one right here. As you see, it's a, it's, we did write down a center of mass equation, but uh, if we want it to be relativistically correct, it's really center of energy or center of momentum. So we went with a center of momentum equation. And there you see this, the rate of change of center of momentum. And you notice that the, first, the very first easiest terms go like m dot and x dot, so the mass change times the velocity. The mass change, by the way, I haven't written the equation up for it, but it is the gravity is, is involved in that. And the mass change, or delta m of t, goes like 1 over 4 pi rho g, c squared, and then rate of change with energy, with, with, with time, second derivative, so d2 e by dt squared. So the, the change of energy, so it's like a power, a rate of change of power that comes into the, the mass fluctuation. And as you notice by this equation, uh, we have to have that, since the, the masses are talking about a system that has basically two masses, mass one, mass two, and they're, they're made to oscillate like this. OK, so we need the masses to be different from each other, and also that the mass changes have to be different from each other, so that uh, when the mass changes are different, that equation shows you, since the velocities are equal and opposite, that this is going to accelerate. 
and it's required to accelerate by, by conservation momentum. So uh, that's, that's, the base, that's the only equation I'm going to show you. I'm not going to worry you with any other ones. Uh, so if you want more details, I'm going to ask you to come to the post and we'll, and we'll discuss it in more gory detail. Um, there have been some replications of our device sh showing the thrust. Uh, there's actually three replications, but two of them, one at the Technical University of Dresden by Martin T Tajmar, or, or he's become known as Tamar, and also the um, University of Applied Sciences, and that was in Austria by, by Nembo Boldrini. So what is this device I'm talking about? Well, it's, it's just this little, whoops, wrong button. Uh, it's just this little device here. It's got a brass mass. It's got a stack of PZT crystals. These crystals are, and, and the scale is by the side of it, so I can easily hold this thing in my hand. It's about four centimeters long. Um, there's a stack of eight crystals in there, two millimeters thick. And two of them, two extra ones, are, are very thin. They're only 0.3 millimeters thick, and they're not powered. They're, they're, we're just using those for a strain gauge. And the, uh, the eight crystals are made up of PZT, that's lead zirconium titanate. Um, it's got a, a, a brass end mass, which is th about three quarters of an inch length, and about 28, 29 millimeters in diameter. And also this uh, brass, uh, uh, sorry, aluminum end cap is uh, about 28 millimeters in diameter, and about a quarter of an inch thick, something like that. And basically we, we uh, feed energy into the PZT discs at uh, a single resonant frequency, which is about 36 kilohertz. And uh, we also get a, a harmonic frequency from uh, piezoelectricity. So we've got piezoelectricity and we've got electrostriction. So the electrostriction is actually at two, two times the frequency. So there's actually two excitations going on in there. And, and we need both of them to get the, get the uh, thrust from the device. This whole device is put into the, the Faraday cage here and is uh, on one end of a torsional pendulum. The central part has a couple of C-flex bearings in it. The C-flex bearings basically are just a small little cylinders with a, a, a cross-shaped pieces of metal inside which sort of flex and bend so the whole thing can twist um, about the vertical axis. And so the, the Faraday cage would move sort of out of the board and into the board and, and then this thing would go in the opposite directions of course. The masses you see here are just to compensate for the weight of the Faraday cage. Um, and over here you see um, a stepper motor and on it is a Filtec sensor. And the Filtec optical sensor is what is giving us our position measurement. So uh, the, the, the stepper motor uh, has a has a little a, a optical probe next to it, and the probe is shining onto a, a shiny plate. The plate is attached to the balance beam, so when the balance beam moves, you get a separation between the, the probe tip and the shiny plate, and that's what's giving us a, a displacement measurement, which we can then convert into, uh, f using the torque of the, of the, the, the spring constants of the C-flex bearings, we can convert that into a force, and that's how we measure the forces. Uh, I keep pressing the wrong button. Uh, here's the... Uh, uh, little schematic again. There you see the two two very thin strain gauge uh, ones, and um, um, the mass fluctuation that we're talking about is very very tiny. So I should point that out that we're only talking of delta m over m of roughly 10 to the minus 8, which is roughly the Planck mass. So it's it's small, but then to put that in in uh, perspective, if you think of a hot iron and the hot iron being heated to about 200 uh, Kelvin, uh, that delta m over m would be something of the order of 10 to the minus 12. Uh, similarly, if you think about the, the mass of the sun, that the, the electromagnetic radiation coming from the sun being ejected over 100 years, uh, the delta m over m of the sun would be 10 to the minus 12 as well. So that's actually a fairly big uh, number. So anyway, moving on. Um, here is what we actually get from our experiments. And uh, what you can see here is um, several curves. So I'm going to explain them to you. Uh, the blue curve is just the voltage applied. And that's, of course, AC, but you're seeing the amplitude of the voltage applied in pulses. Um, in fact, the pulses are, are actually chirped pulses. Uh, what you see below here is inverted. The, the chirp starts at a high frequency and then uh, chirps onto the lower frequency. So you see nothing really happening at the beginning of the chirp. And then as you go onto the resonant frequency, suddenly the, the thrust, which is this red line, uh, jumps up when it hits the resonant frequency. And then uh, we switch off the pulse, and that's where you see a transient happen. And then it swings back because, of course, it's a pendulum, so it's going to swing a little bit. So. Um, 
mask. So you see this thing switch on, it comes off, and then, it, then it, there's a little oscillation in there, which you can't see very well. And then the second pulse hits. And again, you don't see very much for the, for the switch on, but as soon as it gets to the resonant frequency, it, you see the, the thrust curve uh, jump up. And again, as it switches off, boom, there's a, there's a transient when it switches off. So we've managed to eliminate the, the first transient, which would be the switch on transient, <laughs> and to only see the, the one at the end. So it looks like we're just getting a pulse and a pulse and a pulse and a pulse, and that looks like a space drive to me anyway. So, uh, so there, there's the picture of it. Uh, you've also seen here a green, uh, there's the green curve, that's the inverted frequency. The brown curve is the, what the output is from the strain gauge, and it follows the, the, the voltage pulses fairly well. And again, the red curve is the, is the actual thrust. Okay, so we've performed a number of new experiments, including the uh, statistical analysis of the chirped pulses. Um, encouragingly, uh, we find that the experiments are matching the independent analysis by Jose, mathematical analysis, um, for, for two different experiments. One is uh, the complicated force behavior and how it uh, changes with the brass mass. So if we change the actual mass on the end, uh, you'll find that uh, you get different thrust levels. So we found that for the laboratory system anyway, there is an optical ma optimum mass. And, uh, and we, we have been able to confirm that experimentally, and, and the theory also confirms it. And also the theory confirms that the force should be versus voltage should go like a voltage to the fourth. And I'm going to show you uh, that graph in, in a moment. What we want to do, and we're ready to test, is a state-of-the-art material, pin PMNPT, which is lead indium niobate, lead magnesium niobate, and lead titanate materials, which are crystalline. What we've been dealing with so far have been sintered disks of PZT, so it's powder. And when you look at that stuff under an electron microscope, it looks, literally looks like a pile of rocks. It looks pretty nasty. It's got holes in it. It doesn't look very good at all. So we'd like something that's a lot cleaner a lot much more, much more crystalline, and we think that's going to give us, it's, it's got much better properties, so the piezoelectric and piezoelectric and that restricted constants are much higher by a factor of 10, and we're hoping that would give us likewise a factor of 10 increase in the thrust, we hope, so we don't know yet, we haven't tested it. But uh, as for the voltage scaling, let me show you this plot. One of these plots has been uh, in, in the literature, but we only had four points, so people weren't very convinced with it. But now we have many more points, as you can see. Each one of these dots represents one of the chirps that you saw in that, in that previous graph. So there's an awful lot of chirps on, uh, <laughs> being evaluated here. And then, and of course, we, we, there's a set of voltages here and a set of voltages there and another set and another set. So that was basically our four sets because we're just adjusting the amplitude of the, um, uh, or dialing, dialing up or down the, the amplifier in our system to, to get these different ranges. But this is a number of uh, chirps here, a number of chirps there, are diff at slightly different voltages, range ranging from about 120 up to uh, 250 uh, volts here. And uh, this curve that you see is a regressive plot done by Excel. And you can see it's giving you a number plus V to the 3.79, which is pretty darn close to four, which is what we predict theoretically. So uh, the, these numbers were got by the program doing a regression fit. And that was our R squared. So how, how accurately the curve fits the dots, basically. So um, now to the actual mission. Uh, I've talked to you about the, the lab, lab thing, but I'm sure you're interested in the mission more. Um, so the spacecraft must survive 25 to 30 years a long mission with, with a full reactor power available to the drive that, that must last about 20 years. The payload is going to be about 400 kilograms with more desirable. Uh, the spacecraft must operate and navigate autonomously, obviously, for that distance away. You can't really wait four years to get a, get a, a resupply from Earth, can you? Um, we're thinking hopefully about one gigabyte per year of, uh, of data transmission over the four light year distance. Um, we think the space trap will survive a velocity up to about 0.4 C. Um, and all the electrical booms and things are going to be folded up and, and only deployed when you're actually in the, in the solar system. So when it's in motion, everything will be folded away and packed away for, for safety. Um, so let me go on to the next picture. We'll actually see the, the probe. Uh, so here it is. Uh, here you can see roughly the size of it. We hope we'd be able to collapse this thing down so it would fit in the nose cone here of the SLS. And maybe the SLS could actually launch this thing for us. Um, it's actually derived from uh, the Prometheus project, the icy moons. Uh, only we decided that uh, it was more, it, it looked nicer anyway with three planes, but it's not just because it looks good, it looks like something out of Star Wars. It's actually because it reduces the length and also reduces the weight. So the, the weight of the shielding is actually reduced when, it, when you use the triplane uh, system. So there's actually three planes there, not four. And it looks about 44.7 meters long overall, about the size of a 747, basically. Um, and our little METs will be right at the center of mass here. Because they're sort of dependent on frequency, you want to put them in a nice rigid spot, and the best spot would be the center of mass. 
So um, we're using a reactor which is isn't available right now, but may be available in about 20 years from now. So five megawatts thermal, 1.5 megawatt electric. Um, we're hoping, and, th and that wasn't just a guess, that was from a slide uh, from Lee Mason from the NASA Glenn Research Center. So he suggested that might be possible. I've also got his slide in my backup, so if you want to see it, I can show you later. Um, so what does this probe look like? Here it is. Here's our nice Lambda design, like I say, something out of Star Wars. Uh, but the important point is that the mega drive is right at the center of mass. All the mega drives, plural, I should say, are right here. Uh, we have uh, the shielding, which is also a Lambda design. And we've also got this shadow uh, shield from the reactor, 30 degree shadow shield. And then uh, down at the, we have a, an optical communication system, uh, one kilowatt, uh, 1.2 meter diameter, uh, 1.06 uh, micro, micrometers for the, for the laser. Um, all these booms and all these bits sticking out would be folded away for the flight, so they wouldn't be sticking out at 4.0 C. That wouldn't be a good idea. Um, and also this thing here, we, we thought at first an RF antenna, but we'd really like to have this thing on a boom and then, f and then fold it out when we get to within about 100 AU so that we could actually physically look forward and look into this planetary system and see where we're going. So we were thinking more of uh, perhaps um, the kind of optical system like lorry that they have on, on uh, New Horizons, something like that would be fitted here, it would be on an optical boom so you could swing it out and then say, just look directly forward in between these two planes. And that's what we're hoping for. Um, a, a possible shakedown mission would be uh, to cruise along to the gravity, solar gravity lens. And since Slava is going to talk about that next, I thought I'd just uh, throw that up there as a, as a possible uh, beginning mission. And that's only out to about 100 AU. Because we'd really like to have a really close look at Proxima B to know what the atmosphere is like. Because, hey, it may, be, uh, it may be so dense that we can't see through it. You may have to take a radar with us. So we'd, we'd ha like to have a closer look before we go. And then uh, basically, how do we get there from here? Well, we've just planned out roughly what, would, what we'd have to do in the next 20 years or so, 25 years, to make this mission possible. But right now, we're at this sort of stage where we've got no new physics, um, we, we've, uh, we've made slight improvements, and we're seeing that the, our, our theory is, is matching the experiment, which is really good. The next steps for NIAC-2, say, if hopefully, um, would be to, to start modeling arrays of devices and maybe get this thing up to a millinewton, and that would be really great. Um, but uh, apart from that, um, uh, we want to publish more papers. Um, we want to uh, increase the thrust, obviously. Um, there's just a few more things there that uh, I'm saying we'd, we'd love to do a, a test on a CubeSat, possible. Um, so I'm, I'm really anxious to hear about the, the Navy guys and what they have to say um, coming up. And then uh, really all I have to say now is thank you very much for listening. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Let's see, just, um, I used to be a physicist, but now I'm a systems guy. So, um, I love your shirt, by the way. <laughs> it says Thank asteroids you. on the front. It looks good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, at, from a systems, from a propulsion system perspective, we define propulsive efficiency as the ratio of the kinetic energy of the payload divided by the input electric power for an electric, this is an electric propulsion device. Right. So as I understand the physics of this, most of the energy is coming from motion elsewhere in the universe that's being coupled into the directed, ener directed motion of the device. So in that sense, it doesn't violate conservation of energy, but it has a propulsive efficiency many thousands of times greater than one. And it also doesn't violate conservation of momentum because it's coupling into the mass in the rest of the universe. So right. is it dumb physicist and a used to be propulsion systems engineer. Did I get that right? Yeah. The thing with the, the efficiency, people talk about ISP, and of course it doesn't really count for our rocket just because you know there really isn't any mass being ejected. So ISP is usually the, the momentum change over mass ejected. So it's really difficult to come up with a really good way to describe efficiency other than perhaps the Q of our system because it's all to do with natural frequencies. And unfortunately the Q of our system is really low, and one over the Q is a sort of an efficient right. factor. So and, I would suggest that, that you just use the standard propulsive efficiency which is the kinetic energy of the vehicle. Kinetic energy. Divided by the input electric power. Divided by input electric power. Kinetic energy of the vehicle divided by the right. integral of the input electric power. Yeah. yeah, the trouble is though that the, the efficiency in that sense will, would increase as we go faster. That's not a trouble. <laughs> that's, that's what we call a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> and the efficiency of this device is, you know, 
millions to one, especially as it accelerates to high velocity where the coupling with the rest of the motion in the universe increases. So, I mean, I just wanted to make sure I got it right from a systems perspective. No, that sounds good to me. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, thanks. I, you and I had a nice long conversation yesterday. We'll have more today. Right. Um, I think it would uh, be helpful if I could strip away some of the, uh, the aspects of this for, for people. Um, it, basically, let, let's forget the piezo stack for the moment. Let's just have two masses and a spring in between, okay? something people can relate to. So it's like a slinky with, uh, with two masses, but the masses are unequal. And basically what, what you're saying is if I have two masses and a spring, and we'll assume a spring has infinite Q for the moment, so there's no loss mechanisms in the spring, just to make it simple. Uh, unfortunately, in that case, it won't work. It, we, I, I really oversimplified the diagram, or what I was saying, with the two masses and the spring, you absolutely have to have um, the, the, the damping in there, otherwise you would never get a change of energy, because so you'd get kinetic energy going into momentum, into potential energy and back again, and you'd get zero change of energy. So I absolutely have to have damping. It's just that the equations get so messy, I can't write them on the board. Okay, well, I'll put in whatever damping you want. Okay, okay. thank you. We'll, we'll have a, a damping mechanism. Okay. Um, but essentially what, what you, it boils down to is two masses in the spring and, and a little damper. Okay. Right. And, and the idea is that we can couple into the universe and propel a system anywhere. We could launch from the surface of the Earth. We could launch anywhere we want. And, and I think it's the fundamental physics of that very simple experiment. You know, let's get away from all the piezos and everything else and just think about it in terms of two masses, unequal, and a spring. And this, of course, violates many people's sensibilities. And I think this is why it's been so difficult. Um, but. You know, I, I, this is very interesting and something that we should talk further about. But, you know, we now have the mega system and the EM drive, which people have probably heard about. And, you know, this is kind of in a different realm than most propulsion systems. So, you know, we need, we need to make sure that we understand the basic physics of what's going on first. Right. And it is a very complicated system, so I have to always oversimplify to try and make a model. In fact, my student, uh, uh, Nolan Van Rossum, is in the room somewhere too, and he was so kind to make a really nice animation of the spring moving, but I really couldn't use it because it was too oversimplified, even though it looked really cool. Thank you, thank you, Nolan, again. And thank you, Gary, for doing the slides. And I should also say thank you to uh, Tom Brose for the really nice CAD models that are in the, in the diagrams here that you saw. Hi, uh, John Brophy from JPL. Uh, I have much easier questions for you. Uh, first of all, in the experimental setups where you're measuring the, f the force, uh, what is, what's the average input power to get those? Oh, the average input power, power is about 200 watts. 200 watts to get a, a few micronewtons. So, so the question is... Um, right now. <laughs> We're hoping to improve that. Okay. So uh, this, this system looks so relatively simple uh, to do experimentally. Why haven't you already scaled it up to a, uh, a thrust level where you're not at the you know, limits of detectability? To, you know, to detect a few in one or two micronewtons is an extraordinary dif difficult thing to do, as you It is definitely difficult. Out. So why not scale it up to much higher power levels and, and you know, just... Well, uh, as soon as you increase the voltage, of course, you're increasing the electri electric field across those little tiny disks and you could get arcing and, and things happening. Also, they're getting hot. Yeah, but, so you so could, why, you could why, melt them and, but, and lose the polarization. But your object is the size of your hand, right? Why they not are. just make it the size of two hands? Or, well, then the or, frequency, the natural frequency goes down, and we found the thing goes with the frequency to the power cubed. So the force is actually dependent on the frequency. So we actually want smaller devices, not bigger ones. We want an array of, of very, very small devices, which is probably more realistic than using a big fat one. Even though the, the radius actually might help us, but the actual big, just going bigger is not necessarily better in this case because it, it is very complicated it really it really isn't just masses with a spring it really is more complicated than that and and uh, I didn't do the theory justice I'm afraid not not in 15 minutes but uh, it, it is it is more complicated all right I'm at, at a lot so to scale this up you'd make so just make a whole bunch of smaller we I, have to we have to make a whole bunch of smaller test. ones that's for sure and we have to start testing it and we have to do a good analysis of it a computational analysis of the arrays all right thank you and, uh, thank you Hi, Siegfried Jansen with the Aerospace Corporation. Yeah, I, you simplified it a lot because <laughs> with, with two masses, how do you determine whether it goes left or right if they're oscillating horizontally? So don't you have to transfer energy to one side while you're accelerating that mass? Or 
No, Is actually... Is there a simpler it, way of explaining this? Yeah, well, it, it, it turns out that uh, as you go through the resonant frequency, the, the device will actually change direction. So that's a nice thing, actually, because we could use it to our advantage. If we have these things solidly affixed to the probe, uh, if we change the frequency, we can actually change the direction. So depending on if we're slightly above the resonant frequency or slightly below the resonant frequency, this device will actually change direction. And you have to be spot on the resonant frequency, and then the direction it will move in actually is toward the smaller mass. So it goes towards the aluminum mass end. Oh, different size masses. Right, exactly. So they always have to be okay. unequal. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Is there anything from online?